This is the the Lions Injury Podcast with our injury expert, Will Carroll. You can find him on Twitter, easy enough, at Injury Expert. Uh, Will, first of all, before we get into the NFL injuries, and there are a handful to discuss going into week one here, I know you are a man who loves his craft beer, loves to smoke some meats going into the season here. It is it is prime barbecue season. So what, what are you working on these days, man? What are you drinking? What are you eating? Uh, yeah. What am I drinking right now? Lots of bourbon. Yeah, I'm, I'm on a okay. keto diet. So unfortunately, can't have any beer, which I really, really miss. The only two things I miss on this diet are, are uh, beer and pizzas. And there, there's they haven't figured out keto uh, beer quite yet. Uh, <laughs> I tried that that low carb beer. Uh, that's just beer flavored water. So I've been drinking lots of good bourbon. Uh, but this weekend, I've got uh, a bavette that I'm going to grill, and then. Uh, Probably going to do some more fajitas. I just got a new flat top, which I love. And so I've been uh, doing a lot of stuff on there, uh, cooking breakfast, tons of bacon. Uh, it's, all, it's all good stuff. And uh, I'll have to get you up here and uh, do a whole brisket for you. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you're speaking my language. I live in Louisville, Kentucky now, man. I'm in bourbon country. So all about yeah, that yeah, stuff. Yeah, I got to get down there. And uh, there's, there's a couple small places I'd like to go. I, I hear there's an up and cover called Jim Beam. <laughs> yep. Yeah. There's some Jim Beam down here for sure. My wife used to work at Maker's Mark, so uh, we have a friend who gives us like Maker's Mark bottles that have never been released to the public because they have different combinations that they do. So yeah, you get your butt yeah. down here and use some good bourbon, man. So let's let's oh, talk. Yeah. Some, yeah, let's talk some NFL injuries here, and we're gonna hit on the big names and and your analysis of how severe they are how impactful they are going into the season. But overall, I wanted to ask you about these weird uh, helmet pads that they're wearing going yeah. into the season. What are they and why are they wearing them and why are we just seeing them more now? Yeah, they, this is the first year they've mandated the Guardian cap, which looks like a big puffy pillow uh, on top of the head. So all the players are required to wear them, save quarterbacks and receivers, I think. They're not very heavy. Um, but certainly uh, in non-game situations, they do help reduce impacts and therefore hopefully concussions. And we have seen uh, far fewer concussions in practice. In games, it's tough to tell uh, because three preseason games are already going to see a reduction just because of that. But the Guardian cap is, is going to be interesting. Talking to players, not big fans of them because they look goofy. Uh, players often do not care about anything else. Uh, they get very mm -hmm. comfortable with their helmet. Yeah, uh, and, and they'll wear it forever. You can remember the whole Antonio Brown uh, saga about them not wanting to change his helmet. Tom Brady uh, had a grandfathered-in helmet until they changed the rules uh, again and said you, you, you flat out can't wear it. Uh, certainly didn't seem to affect him when he went to the newer helmet. So we'll see. I was talking to one player who said the thing is these Guardian caps work. And, you know, you see people, uh, you know, go helmet to helmet accidentally and bounce off. He thinks it's actually training people to do that more. And mm. he, he thinks that we're going to see uh, a higher number of concussions in week one, week two, until people kind of adjust back. I don't think that's really the case. Um, you know, I, you have to go way back. To, to Pop Warner football, Little League football, even the start of you know, junior high and high school football to where you really get into technique. Uh, and, and it's so ingrained in these guys that I don't think, you know, three weeks with Guardian Caps is going to make that big an adjustment to what they do. But we'll see, and uh, we'll see soon enough. Yeah, for sure. If they don't adjust, they're going to get penalized for it heavily. It could, it could affect yeah. games if they don't figure it out soon. So uh, for those of you that are new to the lines or new to Will Carroll, Will is going to be covering injuries for us all season long. He's been covering injuries in sports for more than 20 years. He's worked at places like ESPN, Baseball Prospectus, Football Outsiders. He worked at FanDuel when we were doing a show when I was working for the Colts. Uh, and he was he was a, a rep for FanDuel, so he's got a ton of experience in this area. He's written four books on the topic. Uh, he has an upcoming book called The Science of Football, where he's he, he's also consulted with several pro teams in different sports. So um, he he knows his stuff, and he's currently the director of bioanalytics for North Star, a sports science startup company. So when we talk about NFL injuries and the impact of the betting lines. 
there's no better person to talk to than Will Carroll. So let's start with some of the big ones going into week one. I think the biggest one, the most notable one, was Brian Robinson. Thankfully, he's okay after almost, you know, he could have been killed. Uh, two gunshot wounds to the lower body is what we know. The latest is that he's been put on the NFI list, the non-football injury list, which means he's guaranteed to miss the first four weeks of the season. What do you know about the severity of these gunshot wounds? And this this isn't exactly a muscle pull, man. So I, I don't know how much yeah. you can tell us about like recovery time for something like this. Yeah, you know, first, he's alive, and that's that's the first good thing. And it doesn't look like this is going to completely uh, derail his career. Uh, he didn't go full 50 cent or anything. Uh, he was hit in the calf uh, by one of them, and I was told that's a very minor. I, I don't want to downplay getting shot, but, uh, you know, right, yeah. no real damage to the muscle. Uh, he's walking fine. The one that uh, was more problematic is, is it hit him in the butt. Uh, he, Simple as that. He got shot in the glute. Uh, the bullet was removed, uh, and, and he is recovering. But that wound is going to have to uh, close. It's going to have to heal up. That's just standard. I mean, if you cut yourself, there is so much risk of infection in the NFL uh, just because, first off, the locker rooms are dirty. Uh, guys are sweaty and breathing on each other. That's why we had so much trouble with COVID, obviously. But it goes beyond that. If you get MRSA, which was a big concern a couple of years back uh, before we figured out how to kind of control that with, with uh, you know, surface disinfectants, uh, but it's still an issue. So the wound's got to close first. Then he's got to get that muscle back uh, for, for a between the tackles runner, which was his expected role. Uh, you got to be able to push. And so much of that push is coming from the glutes, from the quads, from the hamstring. If he doesn't have that, if it's even unbalanced, he's going to be more at risk of other muscle pulls. Uh, the other thing uh, that uh, talked to a doctor, uh, an emergency medicine doctor about this, I, I was like, what's going to be his problem? And he said, you know, it's his gait. He's got to get back. Mm -hmm. And it's not just that he's able to run, it's that he's able to run normally. Uh, if you've ever had a rock in your shoe, it, you know, it, it's annoying, but a lot of times you're like, uh, I'll get to where I'm going and I'll get the rock out of my shoe. But you don't realize how much you're adjusting. And when you have any sort of muscular injury, uh, you see that gait change. Tons of technology that will allow him to get back. One of the things that they're already doing, I'm told, is using what's called an Alter G, which is a treadmill that actually kind of has a harness and they put air pressure in there. So instead of you know, having 100% of your weight and more with each uh, step, it basically lifts you up. And, and mm -hmm. it's, I think it can get you down to like 30% of your uh, body weight. So as you're building back, you can keep your cardio up without putting damage. Uh, we see a lot of people with sprained ankles uh, coming back from knee surgery use this. Uh, and the Redskins have two of them. And <laughs> those are not cheap. Uh, or excuse me, the commanders have two of them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my first, my first, it's going to uh, take us a minute, man. Washington the commanders are still weird. I, yeah, I, I have no problem with the Cleveland Guardians. I don't think I've screwed that one up uh, in a while, but uh, heck, I, I still call them the St. Louis Cardinals every once in a while. So I'm anyway, going to keep they, calling them. They've got these big, yeah, go expensive on. Air, air pressure uh, treadmill. So that's going to help Robinson. I think he's going to be back in about six weeks. I'm treating this like a severe muscle pull. Uh, because you know, once the bullet was out, that's what it is, is—a muscle tear. Uh, so uh, I think six weeks is about where we're going to see him back on the field. Okay, fair enough. That puts Antonio Gibson back into a timeshare with J.D. McKissick, yeah. but he's he's more of a scat back, satellite back, so we'll see Gibson for at least the first month of the season be the early down back. Um, his, his numbers are off the board at most sports books here. They, they, I think they're hesitant to, to put some numbers out there. And as a better, I'm not sure I'd be interested anyway, because this, this yeah. is total unknown territory with how, how effective Robinson will be when he comes back. Um, will Gibson immediately get benched? Will he continue to see a timeshare? I, if I had to guess, we're going to see just a, a total three man rotation here throughout the season. Once, once, um, uh, once Robinson is back, but, um, running backs don't really move lines, but for, for what it's worth, this line was already on the move for week one. 
Uh, the the Jaguars are three point road underdogs to Washington. That is down from an opening number of four. Uh, I bet it at plus three and a half. There's only one of those left. Minus one twenty is the price at Fanduel. If you still want to get the plus three and a half, Will, were you going to mention something? Yeah, I think where the, where the running backs really alter things is in the point totals. Uh, if, mm. he, if Carson Wentz, uh, their new quarterback there at the Commanders, uh, if he goes to his normal uh, default mode, which is just chuck it, um, you can't slow that down by handing it off. You saw that last year with Jonathan Taylor. It wasn't that they wanted that much volume. It was that if you call a run play, usually Carson Wentz won't check out of it. So I think we're going to see a lot of interceptions. Uh, those tend to move point totals. Uh, he'll, he'll have his pick sixes in there. Uh, I, I do think we're going to see more volume, but I think uh, we're going to see uh, a lot more picks. I think we're going to see a lot more problems with his receivers. Terry McLaurin's got his deal. But, uh, you know, when, when you're looking at, at player props, there's not one of those I like. But I think uh, we are going to see higher point totals, uh, especially in that first week. I, I still think the line on the Jags is a little low. Let's move on to the L.A. Rams and Cam Akers here. He has been coming back from an Achilles. He infamously, I won't say infamously, like really impressively is the proper word, somehow was able to come back in the same season from an early Achilles yeah. tear a year ago. But, but Will, I mean, this has been a lot of talk, not only in the betting community, but in the fantasy community as well, about how effective he can be for the rest of his career because – we have like a sample size of more than 10 running backs now who have tried to come back from an Achilles tear and were never able to get back to the stardom that they once had earlier in their careers. So now we have Cam Akers. Sean McVay has been very clear that it seems to be more of a timeshare going into this year. He we're, he doesn't seem interested in having a Todd Gurley bell cow anymore. Uh, Yahoo's NFL insider Charles Robinson had a sit-down conversation privately with McVay. He went on the Underdog podcast and said that, yeah, he, he wants a timeshare at this point. And if Akers is not able to be as effective as he once was, then perhaps Daryl Henderson is more of the 1A in this backfield for this season. So what can you tell us about Akers and his Achilles injury and how likely he is to get back to his pre-injury form? Yeah, let's address first coming back in season. This was just uh, honestly uh, a, a fluke of the calendar and a fluke mm -hmm. of being the Rams. Uh, the Rams medical director is Dr. Neil Elitrosh, uh, who is one of the top surgeons in the world. Uh, people around the country go to Neil for all sorts of things, uh, whether they're a Ram or not. He's also the Dodgers team doctor, so World Series ring goes next to that big shiny uh, Ram Super Bowl ring. That's pretty nice uh, box set. Uh, yeah. So first, he had a doctor who really kind of changed the game when it came to Achilles surgery. He has a new technique uh, that he started about, uh, he started experimenting with it about 10 years ago. Uh, the one that really uh, was noticeable was Kobe Bryant, who came back quickly, came back very well. People that have had this technique called the PARS, uh, or a mini par, as you'll hear it referred to at times. It's just a different way of putting it back together, stitching it uh, with the tiny little stitches. Um, and he's had such success with it that it's moved from a six to nine month injury to almost always a six month injury. Uh, hmm. Akers was a little bit faster. We always hear that if this was the playoffs, well, it was the playoffs and he came back. Uh, he was ready to go. He had the same burst. Uh, tons of testing on him to make sure he was ready to go, and he was. So I don't get the idea of why people think he's not going to be able to come back well. He already came back. He's had another mm -hmm. six months uh, to have essentially a normal offseason, to strengthen the legs, to make sure there's not imbalances. If he was just coming back, you often will see players, just because they have to be off their leg, or they can't be back in there working out, you'll often see some atrophy in one leg. I think the most dramatic example of that was when Paul George had that uh, horrible fracture and was on crutches for so long because he couldn't put any weight on that leg. I mean, it looked like a tree trunk and, and a stick um, <laughs> when he first came back. But if you look at it now, you can't, if you don't know, you don't know which leg it was. So Akers was the same sort of way. There was a slight imbalance. He's been able to come back. He's had no restrictions whatsoever. 
I think this just comes down to the modern NFL. We don't have bell cow backs anymore. We don't have guys who are, you know, testing that, that old rule of 370. Uh, it's just, you're going to horses for courses now. You want a guy who goes through, uh, does his thing. You've got your third down back. You've got your pass back. You've got thunder and lightning backs. We've got all these different terms for them because, you know, there's a lot of running backs in the league. There's not a lot of people who are the old, you know, Emmett Smith, Walter Payton type uh, does everything back. They just don't exist anymore. And I think this is more uh, a question for what do the Rams want to do offensively more than Cam Akers can't do it like he, he was expected to. If you are bullish on Cam Akers being okay for week one, based on what Will just said, they're, they're pretty conservative numbers. The props are out for the Thursday night kickoff for players, and Cam Akers is sitting at uh, 11 and a half carries for the over-under against the Bills. For context, last season when he returned and was playing at the end of the regular season into the postseason, the four playoff games for the Rams, Akers had 17 carries, 24 carries, 13 carries, and 13 carries. And that was with Sony Michelle in the mix and, and getting some uh, some carries there. The the um, I think it was the NFC Championship game. Yeah, mm-hmm. Akers had 13 carries and, and Sony Michelle had 10. So even if you are baking in a split with Daryl Henderson, Um, that might be the the prop I'm most interested in is over 11 and a half carries for Cam Akers against the Buffalo Bills. Uh, The other props he has over under receiving yards, 11 and a half, two and a half receptions. Um, Yardage total on the ground, 42 and a half for Cam Akers. No real props up right now for Daryl Henderson going into the Thursday night kickoff. Uh, but Akers is plus 145 to score a touchdown, and you can get Daryl Henderson as uh, as long as plus 240 to score a touchdown. Anything there stand out to you? Yeah, I love that 11 because, uh, as you said, even when he came back, he was getting more than that. Even even with the timeshare, I think this is going to be about game script. Uh, you know, if they get yeah. ahead, uh, that 13 carries wasn't because he was splitting. It was because they were passing more. Cooper Cup got hot. Uh, so I think what we're going to see – is without quite as many super hot targets, uh, you know, with Beckham obviously still out, uh, he hasn't re-signed or signed with anyone at this stage. Uh, I don't think they're going to be passing as much. I think there, there's going to be a lot more short game there. Uh, so I love, uh, especially at carries, I, I, I don't think the yardage is going to be there. You know, there's always a chance that uh, any running back is going to break one long play and blow up. Uh, all those yardage shows, right. but you know he's going to have a lot of days of 15 carries, 80 yards. So I love that one. Moving on to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Will, and this is an ACL we're going to talk about with Chris Godwin. And I think a lot of us were surprised to see how quickly he was returning to practice, considering how late in the year that injury was a year ago. Uh, for Chris Godwin. On top of that, Russell Gage has struggled to return to practice with a strained quad. Uh, what are your thoughts on on the way this is going to shake out? Um, at this point, would you be surprised if Russell Gage is going to be effective early in the season and this is the Julio Jones show for their wide receiver three? And then after that, I'll give you a follow-up on Chris Godwin. Yeah, you know, it's going to be very interesting to see. You know, uh, let, let's address one thing. Here in the preseason, the NFL has has kind of not change the rules, but allowed teams to not give injury updates if they don't choose to. So we're seeing a lot of things like lower body, uh, you know, uh, mm-hmm. general soreness, uh, salute. Uh, it, it, it's one of those uh, <laughs> issues where, uh, you know, once we get back uh, next week to regular season, even though it's still technically preseason, in that run up to week one, we're going to get the official injury reports. So this sort of you know, lower body NHL kind of stuff is going to go away. At least we hope so. We still have uh, the official injury report. Some teams have talked about just taking the fine. We'll see whether that goes. But luckily, there are people like me who have enough sources that we can find out what it is anyway. With Gage, they were just saying lower body. It's his quad. Um, so that's not so much an issue. I, I'm waiting to see whether he practices. If, if he's at practice uh, on Tuesday, uh, I feel good about it. If they're holding him out Tuesday, Wednesday, if he's got limited practices at the end of the week, uh, I will be uh, definitely 
more worried about that. And, and yeah, they got Evans. They should have Godwin. Uh, you know, Julio Jones is there. Um, you know, I'll be very curious to see how that team comes together. Theoretically, a new coach, obviously he was there, but no Bruce Arians kind of calling the shots. Uh, the offense stays the same, and Tom Brady uh, is still Tom Brady. I don't think we're going to see a big drop-off. The thing to keep in mind is that you know Tom Brady really doesn't have one, two, three, four. He finds the open guy. If it's his second tight end, if it's his third tight end, even without Gronk, he is going to find you if you're open. That's his greatest skill and what's made him one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. So I'm not so worried about who's the three. If the if it's Gage, if it if it's Julio, if if it's uh, someone further down the line, you, Brady is going to find those guys. It's going to be about can they get open. That's where the muscle strain really affects Gage. If he can't get open, I don't care if he's the one. Um, I'm worried about his get off. Whether he's going to be able to muscle up on people. Uh, for Julio, at this stage in his career, he doesn't have the skills he once had. He hasn't been able to stay healthy for, for a couple of years, but this gives him uh, a great look. I think what he's going to end up doing is using the physical skills he still has, or at least his physical size, and kind of end up being that, that red zone guy, uh, a guy who can just basically do a three-yard hook and post people up. Uh, he's still huge and strong, uh, and he is not scared to go up and take a hit if he can get a first down or a touchdown. So I think Julio is going to have one of those weird things, um, blanket on the name of the Chargers tight end, who used to always do this, who would have like three carries, two touchdowns, eight yards. Uh, I'm getting too old. Oh, man. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm blanket on that one too. I just remember a Natron means from back in the day on the Chargers. Exactly. Fun, but Same sort I, of I thing. Know <laughs> So, uh, yeah, yeah, but, with, yeah, with so the, I, I want to ask – go ahead. Yeah, with, with Godwin, here's the other thing to keep in mind. You know, I, I talked a little bit before about Neil Eltras. He also did Godwin surgery. Uh, knee surgery, ACL surgery is almost automatic at this stage. It's six to nine months. Okay. Guys come back. What doesn't come back is the confidence. Uh, that's one of the things where it really takes a little bit more. Some guys it comes back quicker. They're not worried about it. But you'll see guys come out and not want to cut because the last time they did, their knee gave out. I talked to Reggie Wayne a couple of years ago when he had his. He came back pretty well. Um, he, he was just able to get past that fear. Some guys don't. I can remember, gosh, it's probably 15 years ago, Deuce McAllister was coming back. Uh, and he, he'd been, for the first three weeks, just running up the middle, running up the middle, running straight ahead. And you can be effective doing that. Um, but I... I don't remember exactly, but something like a Brian Erlacher just came bearing in on him. And out of just pure survival instinct, he cut. And he cut on that, that uh, reconstructed knee. And as he was running up the field, uh, CDS had a great shot of him from the front. And you could just tell something clicked. He knew, oh, yeah, I can do that again. And he went on to have a pretty good year that year. So I think with Godwin, you've got to see what he's going to be able to do. I would lay off uh, Godwin for the first couple of weeks on any sort of prop because we just don't know. Um, I imagine they're pretty low. Uh, I haven't looked at them today. But with Godwin, he should come back quickly. This idea that he's being rushed back, um, it, it's been about nine months, and that's where we see it. There's also some really innovative techniques out there uh, I did an article back in January about a doctor who's getting guys back uh, as early as four months. There are some techniques that Whoa. we're seeing out there uh, that that could really speed things up in terms of injury. But the NFL is, to to this point, not used many of them. There's a video out of J.K. Dobbins limping around. Obviously, he's coming back from a knee reconstruction. Are you just as concerned about him having confidence to, to play well early yeah. in the season? Yeah, anybody with that. The other thing to keep in mind is that ACL injuries, we hear about the ACL. Uh, it's the big one. But there's other ligaments. There's other structures in there. So if there, there's something else going on, if there's meniscus damage, if there's an MCL, and oftentimes it's all three. Uh, it's called O'Donohue's triad. 
uh, or sometimes hear it referred to as a terrible triad because it's bad. You don't want all three. Um, the MCL usually isn't fixed. Uh, when Adrian Peterson had his surgery, uh, however long ago that was, he did not have the MCL reconstructed. And so he basically played the rest of his career down one ligament, but his legs were strong enough. It didn't make a, a bit of difference to him. Um, so with, with Dobbins and with Edwards, it was really two different surgeries. Um, there was just more that had to be done. I mean, the ACL part, uh, that was likely the same since it was the same doctor um, using the same techniques, but there was just more going on. You know, anybody can have a car crash, but it's kind of like the difference between a car crash at 30 and a car crash at 50. The damage is going to be a lot different. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a little worried on the confidence level with Edwards or Dobbins, uh, and, and Edwards, I see why he's slightly behind. There was just more damage. Um, anytime it gets to nine months and a player is not back doing everything he's doing, uh, if there wasn't a noted setback, I, it's usually confidence and getting somebody back there. And so, yeah, those are, those are two guys I'm watching and trying to figure out who the heck is going to get the carries in, in Baltimore. I think it's going to be Lamar Jackson. I agree with you on that one. I, I have bet the over on Lamar Jackson's rushing total when it was around 850. If he even misses three games, I think he's going to rush for you know close to 1,000 yards and maybe hit over, hit over that number. So I thought that was conservative. I thought it was pretty clear that the Ravens are going to want to run the ball a heck of a lot more this year than they did last year. The last player I'm going to ask you about on this podcast is Najee Harris. Before I do, I want to let everybody know if you're watching live, you can find Will Carroll's article up on thelines.com right now, or you can go to at the lines us on twitter check out the feed you can find will's article as well on his twitter feed at injury expert uh and as if you guys are not part of the lines nfl pick'em challenge it is a free contest with a ten thousand dollar cash pool to take a shot at winning this thing the winner is going to win three thousand dollars even if you finish top three you're getting a four-figure payday in pure cash quarterly prizes as well of five hundred dollars so if you're not part of that yet, go to play.thelines.com, sign up to, uh, tonight, sign up right now, and uh, take part. It's very simple. You're just going to pick five spreads every week, and whoever does the best is going to win some great cash and other opportunities for prizes as well. I like All cash. right, Will, as we wrap up here, not, yeah, everybody likes cash, right? It's the cash time of the year, baby. Week one is almost here. Uh, Najee Harris comes out that he's dealing with a Liz Frank which gets all of us very concerned because foot injuries are tricky. And we've seen guys try to play through that and it gets worse and they get put on IR and miss the rest of the season. Um, we've seen guys not be as effective when they're trying to play through it. He returned to practice. He said it's fine. But when I heard this, I was already down on the Steelers and they're what looks like an atrocious offensive line again. What are we dealing with here with Najee Harris? Is this a nothing burger or is this a something burger? It's a something burger. I always worry about foot injuries, especially for a power back like Harris. But this is a good time to take a little history lesson. Liz Frank fractures and Liz Frank sprains are in the same area of the midfoot. They were first identified by a French gynecologist who is serving as a combat medic mm. uh, in the Napoleonic Wars. He noticed that uh, guys were getting knocked out of their, the saddle off their horse and catching their foot in a stirrup, and it would uh, snap the bone. Uh, now, Dr. Liz Frank's uh, cure for that was amputation. So we've come a long way. But <laughs> yeah. when you hear Liz Frank, the first thing you have to remember is, why was a gynecologist working on feet? And second, it's that there is both a <laughs> fracture and a sprain. Now, most people understand fracture. Sprain is d any damage to a ligament. So that ligament in the, in the foot, uh, gets torn. Now that happens in degrees. You know, you can have a, a rupture. That's where everything comes apart. You can have a significant uh, sprain where most of the fibers uh, are torn apart and often has to be uh, reconstructed at that stage. Uh, you know, with, with an ACL, uh, that's that's a, a sprained ligament. Uh, what, what Harris's was, was a grade one, which means there's just a little bit of tearing. You know, if you, if you had a rope uh, and, you know, you see a little bit of fraying, you're like, well, you know, I can probably still tow the boat with this thing. Um, you know, if, if you have 
you know, big chunk out of it. That would be a grade two. So a grade one sprain isn't that bad. It tends to heal. He, they, they didn't catch it early, uh, as I heard one person say. Uh, basically, it just wasn't that bad to start with. Um, you know, this isn't usually a wear down injury where, you know, it's, it's tearing, it's fraying, it's going, it's going, finally it breaks. This was almost uh, assuredly a traumatic injury. So minor sprain, time to heal. Uh, everything looks good. Again, you want to see him at practice. You want to see that he can do the things he needs to do. Uh, my sources said uh, he had almost no problem with this, uh, that he took the treatment very well. The one other thing. I want to note with Harris is aside from Derrick Henry, we see a lot of guys come out of Alabama and disappoint in the pros. Um, one theory is that they work so hard there that guys come out essentially worn down. That that being at Alabama hmm. is almost like being uh, you know a pro for four more years. So you, you've got a head start on all that wear and tear. Again, I'm not sure how much stock I put into that theory. I think. They come in with such high expectations, it's easy to disappoint. Uh, and there's as many counterexamples, uh, you know, besides Henry and Mark Ingram, tons of great players uh, have come out of there. Uh, so I, I wouldn't hang that on them. I, I like Harris. I don't like that line. A and so my question is, you know, if, if the quarterback is reasonably effective, they've got some really good receivers. Uh, and I think, you know, Trubisky uh, ought to be able to get outside the pocket uh, and make some plays that Ben Roethlisberger couldn't keep plays going. Feeds right into what George Pickens does well. Uh, Harris wouldn't be involved in that. You know, he's going to get involved if they're having to, you know, do tons of, of running to try to set up the, the play action and the passing off that. Uh, if that if that's the case, uh, they've got bigger problems. Yeah, I'm, I'm strictly looking at unders for Najee Harris. I, I actually uh, bet him under 10 and a half touchdowns for this year and then a, a rogue eight and a half popped up so i bet the over on that so i'm gonna try and middle his touchdowns yeah. this year if he finishes with uh, nine or ten but right now with the way the market sets up on scrimmage yards DraftKings has him at 1600 minus 125 on the under he didn't miss a single game last year had 1667 scrimmage yards so all it could take is one missed game for him to stay under that number yeah. that's a very high number and if you look at his just his rushing yards props they've all come down from 1200 down to 1100 since our Steelers preview on our YouTube channel a couple of weeks ago but there is one left at points bet at 1199 and a half it is juiced minus 140 to the under but to all the points you just made on top of the fact that he was dead last in the league in yards before contact last year, it does not look like the line is any better going into this season. They didn't make substantial investments into it. Uh, most of the grading services have them as a bottom five offensive line. So you, I, I think you really have to run pure again this year for Najee Harris to get the volume, uh, to stay healthy now, and to be better than he was last year when he didn't miss a single game. Yeah. So, and we typically bake into these projections for a running back to miss one to three games. Yeah. So um, I think these numbers are closer to his ceiling than they are anywhere near the middle or his, his floor. And you mentioned the quarterback change as well. Um, I'm, I'm kind of having a debate in my head right now. Do I like the under scrimmage yards at 16 and a half, or do I like the under rushing yards at minus 140 at 1200? I, I, I think I might like the scrimmage yards better yeah. at a cheaper price because Ben Roethlisberger was a statue back there. He's just dumping the ball off to him every time he's in pressure. But now you have a more mobile quarterback, a younger quarterback, where he might be scrambling more often than just dumping it down to his, his running back on a check down. So um, I like both those numbers if you haven't gotten in uh, on, on the Najee Harris markets yet. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on all of those. Uh, I just don't like this team. Uh, I, it, it's one of those things where I think you have to have... I also bet the under on the win total, yeah. yeah. You know, it, sometimes you, you can have really positive injury news, as Harris did, and still be negative on the team. Uh, I'm not negative on Harris's injury. I'm not taking anything off my models for him in the early weeks, uh, but I, I just hate the way this team is likely to play. Yeah. 
I feel you. Will, as always, fantastic insight. We are so excited to have you on board for the NFL season, the first of many injury podcasts coming to you. Uh, we're recording these Friday afternoon, so Friday evening, hopefully, each and every week, so that we give ourselves the best chance of getting the most injury information from the weekly reports from each team before we sign off going into the weekend. So, uh, you can find these each week on our YouTube channel. His article will be up each week during the season at thelines.com. And as always, you can follow him on Twitter at Injury Expert. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. Happy football season. Best of luck with your bets. And we'll see you next time.